Welcome to Tomorrow's Tech Today, bringing you the latest in technology, talent, and transformational change. With me, your host, Professor Sally Eaves. Hi, everyone. I'm Professor Sally Eaves, and a very warm welcome to this special feature on generative AI and the future of human and machine partnership. This is a Dell Technologies and Tomorrow's Tech Today special feature and really is, I mean, one of the biggest topics of our time. We really want to cut through that and look at kind of hype from hope, look at the actualization side of things and also not just look at technology, but also culture, skills, process, change management and how this all aligns together. So without further ado, I'm delighted now to welcome John Reese, Global Chief Technology Officer at Dell Technologies. Welcome, John. Great to be back together. Yeah, it's always good to see you, Sally. Thank you so much. And, and actually, to set this off, perhaps a great place to be begin is kind of what's happened, you know, over the last time since we've spoken. I think it's about a year ago last summer. We actually came together then, didn't we? Talked about automation, kind of the age of convergence, and particularly the human machine partnership. As I said, so much ready to change. I think the scope and scale has been unprecedented. But what's your biggest takeaway there in terms of this rise and acceleration of all things generative AI? And has your perception kind of really changed since we came together last time? Well, well, you know, it's it's, it's funny. I like I, I've told people we we kind of have like the period before Chat GPT and the period yes. after Chat GPT. And for for those of us on the technical side. Not much changed, to be perfectly honest. You know, large language models are not new. AI is definitely not new. We've been dealing with, you know, human machine interfaces and artificial intelligence and moving work into machines for, oh, I don't know, since the industrial revolution. So it's been, you know, this is not a new concept, but but that moment in time that happened last year where suddenly this this chat bot materialized that, you know, and I can speak for myself, the first time I used it. I had this kind of pause moment. I'm like, I know a lot about what I'm interacting with. But the experience was so good and so natural that I felt like we had crossed over a point where this technology that we all knew was the key technology to move work into the machines, to basically allow machines to do cognitive work and advanced work. And, and it, our, our challenge for the last two decades has been it's the rarefied air of experts to do it. And all of a sudden, I'm interacting with a chatbot that is speaking human. And is interacting with me in a way that is so natural and so, uh, uh, you know, relatively transparent to people that the aha moment for me was we've suddenly changed the world of AI from an ecosystem of having 100,000 experts that can use it to having all of humanity that can speak human language interact with it. And that that is the breakthrough. And, you know, I kind of joke before that period of time. I don't know. The technologists cared. Everybody else thought it was a mystery or a future. And at that point on, we now stimulated the entire population of the world. Anybody who could interact with this could suddenly start thinking about what it was, what the art of the possible was. And so the amount of disruptive innovation that a technologist could never figure out, but that a practitioner in a domain could, but the practitioner didn't understand AI, when we took that barrier away, we've now seen this massive acceleration and, and it is now something that has moved from a theory and an idea of the future to extremely main, mainstream in every enterprise and every use case. And that that does not happen very often. And, and it was a profound moment, which is extremely exciting because you know, just because the impact this could have if we get it right. Exactly. And in terms of that impact, A, that pervasiveness you're talking about there and that scope and scale and, and speed of change we're talking about. But you're absolutely right. The applications here, not just for business benefit, but for societal benefit as well. Really, really, really interesting. And the democratization aspect of getting involved in this technology that you really brought to the fore there, I think so powerful. Even even just tomorrow, uh, I'm doing a, a session not just with Jack GBT, but also, for example, with Llama 2. And again, I think that's another really interesting area. It isn't just Jack GPT. Is it, if you see what I mean? And so many different areas here. So I think the awareness point is also key. There isn't just one approach to do this. And again, like with all technologies, aligning it to your personal purpose or your team or your organization is really, really important too. But I love that. And also the, the familiarity of using this technology. I think that's the other thing that, that's changed too. Certainly, there was some Dell research that came out also about a year ago, and it was really bringing to the fore, I think, about the familiarity of use of technology. And if you have that, if you feel comfortable, and 
if the adaptations are going in that direction, you kind of go with that. So I think that's the other thing that's helped here as well. The way some of the training, for example, that's being delivered around these new new opportunities and the fact a lot of it, you know, for example, phone based, you know, using the apps, things that people are very comfortable with, there's technology in your pocket. I think that's also helped to bring more audiences into using this technology today. Well, one of the things we have seen in our, in our internal work, um, by the way, you're absolutely correct. You know, ChatGPT was like the the first example of this that people could kind of grok and understand and, and explore. But it is a massive surface area. They, there are open source models that are, are you know, or foundational models that are materializing. There are obviously lots of closed source ones. There are cloud scale models. There are domain specific models. There are process specific models. All of them using this con- the concepts that kind of are under this umbrella of large language models and generative AI. And so it's it's quite a complex ecosystem that's moving very fast technologically, which basically means we have an abundance of tools that if you want to go solve one of these problems, you don't have to spend a little time figuring out which tool and how to put it together and make it work. But it's not as if there's only one option. There are many, many options, which means that, you know, in your particular circumstance as an enterprise, if you have a, a regulated environment, if you have a constrained environment, if you have a data problem, there are probably people working on solving those problems so you can take advantage of Gen AI. And so, so it's a very, very different environment. But but one of the things that, you know, is fascinating in our own internal usage of, of these technologies is, is that we, we started to discover that they are creating new jobs. You know, this is the thing that we've been talking about forever. AI is going to disrupt the world. It's going to take all the jobs away. No, not at all. There's a whole bunch of jobs that might get changed and some of them might disappear. But even in places like, um, you know, we're doing a lot of work around content. We believe content. Generative AI is very good at creating content. Well, humans create content. So if the AI can create content, does that render the human obsolete? And it turns out, no, not at all. Um, the human doesn't do exactly the same work. The Gen AI system can dynamically create manuals and can produce content, marketing collateral, and can create it in a tone and a, and a personalization level that we never were able to do. But then we discovered, oh, like all AIs, there are robot keepers. There are people who have to make sure that it keeps running, that the data is curated, that there's editorial control. And so you're immediately seeing organizations that lean into this discover very quickly that the human doesn't disappear. It just gets recast into a new mold around the AI that allows the whole system to scale. And so, you know, we predicted a while back that the vast majority of jobs in the future don't even exist today. And this is a good example of a whole bunch of new jobs. Even in the technical ranks, the most important skill from a technologist perspective of dealing with Gen AI on a broad scale is prompt engineering. Most people didn't even know what that word was literally a year ago. It wasn't even a term of art. And now we're saying you're interacting with a generative AI system that takes input through prompts, whatever those prompts are, the syntax matters. And so you're learning this language to make the gen AI system do the things you want it to do in the most efficient way. Uh, yeah, again, another example of we could never, we couldn't have predicted that three years ago, but we saw it happen. And what it did is created new skill sets, new training curriculum, new education of humans and new jobs, which is you know exactly how technology usually plays out. And the last thing I'd leave you with is in our own internal work, what we found is even the definition of a prompt or the interface is somewhat wide open. You know, today we see, you know, applications that you type in kind of like a search engine, you get an answer. And then we started to explore and we realized I'm not even sure the web page is the right interface. We have examples where we built Gen AI systems within Dell to do things like, you know, answer any technical question you could imagine around our products. That's kind of an interesting thing to do. And sure, you could put that into the normal support interfaces or put it on Dell.com or put it into a web page. We'll do all that. But then we discovered it's just an API. So why not, I don't know, put the chat bot in Slack and let people just interact with it like it's another Slack user or whatever. You know, you're, I have argued for years that the right way to think about AIs, the long-term way to think about AIs is that they are users. They are not technology. They are a class of user. They consume IT resources, they do work. And if you think of them effectively as a user, then you discover that if I have a user in my overall company that's really good at answering technical questions, well, how do I want to interact with them? Do I want to call them? Do I want to chat with them? Do I want to have them produce content? And so as we think more about these Gen AI systems, we're discovering that they're not only pretty powerful, but they're also incredibly diverse and they also recast humanity around them. So lots and lots of learnings going on right now that I think are going to proliferate almost every company over the next several years. 
Absolutely. And I think another thing that came to the fore when you were talking about that is um, using generative AI for the purposeful application of generative AI. Because again, you know, you mentioned there about the use of prompts and how that language um, or that word even is used and described differently in different places. And sometimes there's a bit of ambiguity there. I think the same thing with, with the use of generative AI as a term. Sometimes you look at, you know, case studies and examples and, and, and content going back to, to things online as well. And actually you look at it and you think, well, you didn't actually need to use Gen AI potentially in that place or has it been described as that and actually isn't really because you didn't need to actually use that in that particular context so I think getting granular about what those differences are making sure we're using language in the correct way as well to help people grow yeah. through this I think is important too um, but it also brings me on to kind of the, the how and the why of applying this and being more you know centralized and strategic about the use of AI too so I'd love to see what you are thinking there about you know for example leaders today what would be your kind of top takeaways about what you should do for the implementation of AI strategies to do that with with purpose, you know, thoughtfully and strategically right across the business. Yeah, you you hit on a a fantastic point that wasn't, again, obvious in the early days, but now that we're, you know, six, 12 months into this process, and that is that the large language model isn't actually equivalent to the outcome that you're trying to achieve. It's just a tool. And like we have an example, one of our internal projects that we're using to kind of re-plumb Dell and make it, you know, in the front end of the technology consumption, it, you know, it has five independent large language models as part of the architecture. It's got Llama 2 and Falcon 40 and, and, and they're all doing different things. Again, they're users. We have one of them that's, you know, reading a vector database and producing content, you know, a, a way to in human language articulate and interact. We have another one that's an adversarial gen, a large language model that actually answers the same question, compares it, and decides whether or not that should be published or not. And so, you, you know, when we think about it from a, a, a an implementation perspective here, so the good news is on in Gen AI is it has immense opportunities and it will fundamentally shift a huge amount of work into the machine layer that will change what humans do, but largely it's going to create a, a simpler, better, more effective world around us. And, and it's going to create growth and all the other things. Tech, great, good, lots of opportunity. The downside is from an implementation perspective, there are a whole bunch of things that you have to be able to navigate. The first is the just the diversity of the ecosystem. Which models do you use? How do you incorporate them? Which technologies are important to you? The second is well, what data are you using? It turns out if you don't have control of your data, and we've been saying this for years, all bets are off in doing an effective AI offering because it's driven by the data. It's trained on the data. Even fine tuning a model requires you to have an understanding of your data. And so, so a lot of people are kind of behind the curve on getting their data organized. And even worse from the data perspective is even if you have your data organized for traditional uses, like, you know, hey, your customer database sits in a well curated database that is used to transact sales. That's actually the wrong format for a large language model. A highly structured databases are the worst place you could feed data into a large language model. What you want is unstructured, high performance, kind of simplified data architectures. And so, so there's a lot of data work that's going to have to go on. And then, then it gets into the question of, well, how do you optimize the performance of the system? How do you make sure that it is energy efficient? Because if you do this and blow up the planet with your carbon footprint, that's not a good thing. And then on top of it, we have this whole litany of regulatory and compliance obligations that are unsolved. We we don't know necessarily about, you know, using public models, whether or not we have the right to use them because of copyright law and patent law. We know that if you use your own data, obviously you have much more control. If it's your data and you build a, gen, a, a, a content for, through a generative AI system that is your content, then it's pretty sure that you have the rights to use that. The minute you go into the public world, you have no idea what it was trained on. You have no idea if there's a copyright flowing through and all of that case law hasn't even been settled yet. So that leads many customers to being, if you're conservative and focused, you really want to make sure that for the things that expose you to risk, you have to be very careful about curating, not just the tool chain you use, but where you do it and what data you use, which lends you to more private instances and co-location and things where you have more control, which is more work than just letting somebody else do it for you but the reality of it is, is in the real world of generative AI, if you want to actually use it, you're using it to transform and replumb your business and putting risk into the very center of your business inadvertently is a very bad, bad strategy. And so, so we're having to navigate through that. Um, in general, that's where Dell plays. We are, we are in the business of 
basically trying to help customers navigate where to run these, how to organize it, how to get their data structured, which tools to use, and most importantly, to be able to apply it for enterprise outcomes. Uh, you know, and because and, remember, here's a, one last thing to leave you with on the implementation. We have to realize this, this entire surface area is broken into three areas. There are public generative AI systems like ChatGPT and BARD and others, which are basically the replacement of the search industry. And, and, and you know what? You would never dream about building Google inside of your, your enterprise. You don't need that. You don't need the entire search of the internet. Those will continue to be publicly accessible services. And much like search engines, they have some hair on them. They, you're not sure if they're marketing to you or not. You're not sure whose content it is. You're not sure if it's 100% accurate. I mean, if anybody blindly trusts Google, they're silly. Just like you shouldn't blindly trust a generative AI system acting as a search engine. But there's a role for them. And they're very powerful and we use them. But then there are the, the field of study, field of use, uh, use cases of Gen AI, which are how do you build a a better automated doctor or better lawyer. And, and those are generally higher risk because they're tied to your business processes. They're used internally. They get exposed to your private information. And while they're still using large language models, they tend to be fine-tuned. They tend to be implemented in more private instances. And then there's this third category, which you touched on, which are what we call process-specific AI projects, which might not even be a large language model. They might not even be Gen AI. They might just be basic machine learning or reinforcement learning. And we, we shouldn't discount them because our studies show that there's actually an increased amount of innovation and patents being filed and things like computer vision and natural language processing at the same time that the Gen AI boom is going on because it turns out AI isn't just Gen AI. It's a whole bunch of domains and it's about moving work into machines. And some of that work is very, very narrow and specialized using techniques that have nothing to do with Gen AI, but we should take advantage of them because they have the same net effect. And so anyway, customers, punchline behind that whole narrative is, it's a big, complex world to implement. But unlike two years ago, where that was theoretical, it's now existential. If you as an enterprise are not moving forward and redividing your work and incorporating AI into your business in a safe, predictable way, you're going to be behind. And so that, that's, that's the nature of the world. Great opportunity, a whole bunch of work to do it, but potentially an enormous impact if we get it right. Oh, absolutely. I've got a, yeah, so, so much said there, but one thing I, I'm quite visual and I've got like a, like a pyramid or triangle in my head at the moment, almost like, you know, my Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yeah. And when you were talking about that, this, this, the power of the data and what are your foundations, you know, like we talk about with cybersecurity and things like that, you have to have your foundations right. So before yeah. we're getting to the generative AI and the purposeful application of it and making the right choice of the type of intelligence you're using, you have to have your house in order. So that starts with the data. It starts with the right collection its storage its protection all of those kind of fundamentals have to be right and you're moving kind of through that journey your data is a differentiator that you have to take advantage of for all the benefits we're talking about and those use cases you brought to the fore there i think kind of a little way to kind of map through that journey for people and the other thing that sprang to mind when you were talking there as well that whole thing about new job opportunities as well just those points about law and regulation let alone the fact you've got so many geographical differences as well issues like ip leakage that type of thing a the need for private hosting for that particular example but also kind Kind of the new creation roles that there'll be around governance and compliance but also say data wastage as well given how much is archived at the moment so many new opportunities there again that waste could be say a new training aid for people too so it's nice to kind of change that narrative around isn't it yeah yeah agreed and you know it's funny on the data side here, here's an interesting story that i think everybody will go through if they haven't but I, you know it's worth sharing and that is when you start your generative ai journey you immediately gravitate towards, I'm going to replumb my sales force, my finance organization. I'm going to go after really the core processes of my company, the places where my most proprietary, confidential information lives. And then you bring your lawyers in and your legal team pretty much tells you, don't do this. It's too risky. And they're correct if you're talking about like literally take, taking all of your personally identifiable information in healthcare and handing it to a public gen AI system and hope for the best. That would be a disaster. And so they're, they're not wrong. But as we started our journey, we ran into the same thing. We basically we went to legal and we want their, their advice. Their job is to keep us out of trouble. And they, they were very conservative because there's so many unknowns here. And, that, and it was driven by the data. It wasn't about the AI. It was about using the data. And that some of this data is very controlled and confidential and some of it isn't. Anyway, we got thinking about it and we started talking and we asked, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of what we call 360 analysis of anything. 
no matter what point of view you're using, it's always helpful to take a step back and flip it around and kind of look at it from exactly the other perspective. And in this case, we asked a very simple question. We said, the lawyers are telling us that we have to be extremely careful with Gen AI systems because we are concerned about our proprietary confidential data getting to a place or being exposed to something that we can't control and we don't want it to be there. Great. Agreed. The contrarian question is, is there any data in Dell that we want everybody to have <laughs> that it's okay if it's out in the wild? And it turns out there's tons of data, every manual, every piece of marketing material. There are enormous quantities of information that we publicly share today inefficiently through things like web pages and file shares. Wouldn't it be great if that stuff was out there? If, for instance, you know, our marketing material was actually used proactively by the large language models to answer questions about Dell products or to give an opinion about who builds the best storage products or the best computers. Uh, and, and so we started really rethinking it. And, and it was funny because the, the lawyers kind of had a little trouble with this because they're like, well, well, we're not even involved in that conversation. It's like, yeah, because that information already is public but it's information and data that isn't currently used by large language models. So how do we, as a very quick move, make sure that's available? How do we rethink search engine optimization so that the large language models know what Dell's up to? How do we think about you know, where we would develop the tools, for instance, to create content that was already publicly accessible, but to present it out into more customers. Well, in that situation, using a public model or using a, 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 a more open architecture and more third parties probably is a good choice. You can move faster. And so it, it immediately led us to this discussion around data again, that, that your Gen AI outcome is a function of the Gen AI tools and the data and process that you're trying to apply through it. And if you look at the continuum, where to start, you could start the hardest problem of, you know, healthcare information or something like that that's heavily regulated. Or maybe you should start with the easy data problems, which are you already have public data. Wouldn't it be better if it was easier for people to consume? Wouldn't it be better if a customer could interact with a chat bot instead of a web page to answer customer support questions? And it turns out that, you know, those two are radically different in terms of which tools you can take advantage of and what the rules are around them. And so it goes back to there is complexity in this space. But the complexity isn't always resulting in a prohibition to do something. In many cases, it, if you understand the diversity of this ecosystem, there are actually some fairly easy first mover paths that you can take that are far less risky, which will get you value and build up your skill set. And back to our learning exercise, the best way to develop a skill set is to actually work in the field. And in this case, those early ones that are lower risk are actually worth doing, even if they're not the breakthroughs, because they will provide incremental value and they'll provide learning and better prepare you to deal with the harder problems in this space. But it was interesting for us. We went through that exercise with, with the legal team and with our marketing team. And where we settled was, some of our Gen AI projects, the data problems are not very profound. We want people to have the data. We don't need to protect it. We don't need to control it. We actually want it out there as far and broadly as possible. And that's in the interest of our company and other projects. We would be terrified if anybody got access to this information other than authorized people within Dell. And because of that diversity, that helped us frame what kinds of projects, what kind of partners, what kind of tools. And so, yeah, it's it's fascinating the interdimensionality of this entire discussion right now. But, you know, and honestly, my, my last point on that is what we did learn. Is, and much like our position with our, our, our customers is we are a partner. We want to work with you on this. But it turns out even inside of Dell, we're not doing it by ourselves. We're, we, we met with like every startup in this space and talked to them, many of them we're working with because it's an ecosystem play. This will not be done by any one company. This will be done by a collection of companies and academics and researchers all working in this domain and taking advantage of that broad ecosystem is a very powerful tool to navigate something as complex as this. Absolutely. And when you talk about that complexity as well, another thing that came to the fore as you were talking about that, going back to kind of getting these foundations right. Again, the complexity isn't always around, for example, the generative AI. Again, going back to getting the, the foundations right, it can be, for example, having the right change management approach, having the right skills uplift in place. Some of the controls you were talking around, around compliance and governance, but it's all those different elements coming together. Data literacy, frankly, more broadly, but it's it focusing all those different elements will empower you. But another 
thing about um, complexity, things like tool sprawl, vendor sprawl, cloud sprawl, aspects like that too. And I think when we've seen some of the issues around talent supply gaps at the moment, um, but also things around, for example, ops overload and pressure and burnout. Again, if we get all those foundations right, some of this can be used to address some of those challenges too. So really that, that powerful partnership, human machine partnership, going to kind of how we set this up at the beginning you know, on that day-to-day benefit level. I'm super excited about the, the well-being impact we can have here on, on talent in our organizations as well. Yeah, we, we you know, and one of the one of the first domains that everybody will explore are this concept of co-pilots. Yes. You know, it turns out that Gen AI is very good at at actually helping people do their work if 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 it's and if it's truly and, and what makes it a co-pilot is that it's not forcing you to speak machine. It's a machine speaking you, it's speaking human. And by the way, we have some history with this. There, there's a, I'm a, you know, I've been pushing the state of the art in software development for a very long time. And, and when we had a, a company called Pivotal Labs working for as part of the, you know, the, found, the federation, they were pioneers in something called paired programming. And I love paired programming. Yeah, by the way, it's more expensive than any other programming model. It generally requires more infrastructure. The people have to be physically, typically together. But the advantage of having two developers, one writing code, one QAing it at the same time, work and then handing off is you build code fast. You burn through your backlog fast. And most of your defects are found in the front end, not the back end. So you build high quality code. And so, so I love that model. The problem is it's highly inefficient because it requires two human beings to be physically in the same place, interacting like that. Well, turns out when you have a generative AI co-pilot, you are effectively applying the principles of paired programming, except it's a person in a gen AI system, but the gen AI system acts like a person. And so you end up with this kind of human interaction. It's kind of natural for people, but you get the benefits of this, but you don't necessarily have to be physically in the same place. You can do this virtually. And so co-pilots in those situations, they end up they, they actually reduce human stress because you get immediate feedback. You offload some of the boring work. You yeah, and, and whether it's applied to software development or it's applied to customer care, or applied to cybersecurity, every time where that AI becomes more of a, a human interaction, it's more natural for you and you can trust it to do work on your behalf, the actual human experience improves. And, and we, we have seen that over and over again. And by the way, it's not new to generative AI. I mean, think about the ADAS systems in your car. Uh, you know, look, the first time you had a, a lane keeper assistant where a little light came on to tell you that somebody was in your blind spot and your car prevented you from driving across the line, probably freaked out a little bit. But after you get used to it, it makes your life better. It makes you safer. It makes you don't have to think about it anymore. That task has been taken off your plate. Adaptive cruise control, same thing. And so we have this principle of if you get the technology right and you surround a human being with things that augment them, it actually makes them more effective. It makes them happier. It reduces stress. And these are all things that we have to be very focused on. And, you know, but to your point around the foundations, you know, we're still in the phase of trying to define what that means. What is what are the foundations? And so we're very active in the regulatory discussion right now. We're putting out op-eds and we're talking to governments because it's quite fragmented. But, the, you know, our top level message is like at the end of the day, there are kind of three things that need to happen that we need to kind of establish as the foundations. We need to establish a shared responsibility model that this isn't just about AI in a vacuum. It's about the ecosystem around it. If you don't understand data, you can't do AI. If you don't understand people, you can't do AI. You know, these are all related to each other. And so historically, from even a regulatory perspective, a lot of people miss this point that if you try to regulate data in a vacuum or regulate AI in a vacuum or regulate, you know, human experience in a vacuum or even healthcare without contemplating these are all intermixed, you end up with the wrong answer. And so we do believe that AI is so profound that we have to think of it as part of a shared ecosystem. The second is this, we've got to do this securely. We are big proponents of one of the first moves people should make, regulated, regulatory bodies, governments around the world, and even enterprises, is an insistence on transparency. And it's not transparent. I can't tell you how a large language model works inside of it. Nobody can. It's too complex. What I can do is insist that if you produce content by an AI, I should know an AI created it. If I'm talking to a chatbot, I should know it's a chatbot, not a person. And understanding that very simple difference between machine-generated content and human-generated content, interacting with a machine, interacting with a person, is a foundation of trust and security that if we don't get that right... We're going we're gonna to alienate people. We're going to create confusion. But human beings react differently if they know they're dealing with a human being versus a machine. And knowing that up front is critical in kind of establishing that those pillars of security that allow us to trust it 
which we're going to, if we don't get that right, none of this happens. And then the last is around sustainability that, you know, I've argued for a long time, AI would be the largest, most demanding workload we've ever seen. And it is. And the amount of energy it's consuming, the amount of infrastructure it's consuming is massive. We have tools at our disposal. We can use advanced accelerators and we can make them better. We can have efficient data models. We can use AI techniques like transfer learning and other things where we don't have to train a new model for everything. We can use models and partially train them and adapt them. We can deploy edge technology that allows us to essentially do the AI processing where the data is created instead of moving it over great distance and creating all of this complexity. But at the end of the day, you know, if we thought we had a sustainability problem before AI, this is a workload that will radically change the amount of AI infrastructure in the world and expand it dramatically. And if we don't improve the MIPS per watt, the bits per second, all the metrics, we probably will run out of energy and that will be a bad thing for us and our planet. So, so shared, secure, sustainable, those are the foundational things we have to work through from a regulatory compliance, but even inside of an enterprise, that should be part of the strategy about, am I doing this in a way that, that quite frankly recognizes the complexity of AI? Am I doing it in a way that is secure and trustworthy and exhibits trust and increases trust by humans? And lastly, am I doing this in a way that is sustainable over the long term? And if I get any of those ones wrong, we think that's existential. So, oh, absolutely. And and again, it almost brings to the fore like juxtaposition here, doesn't it, in terms of opportunity and challenge? Because in one way, AI can actually have many benefits in terms of reducing consumption. For example, some of the smart dashboarding, for example, in cloud computing, is a project I'm involved in at the moment, has helped to bring it all into one place and help make operational decisions that kind of save money on the bottom line, but also deliver energy benefits as well for, for community. So there's many examples like that. Similarly with security, you know, in one way, AI can really drive forward some of the things we see, for example, around alert fatigue and yep. those missed threat opportunities because there's just so much happening. I can really drill into that, look at pattern yep. identification, and really kind of help you get ahead of problems, you know, that active learning, active listening, and being kind of ahead of the issue rather than retrospective all the time. But equally, you know, AI versus AI um, can be one of the biggest kind of threat grounds as well um, within cybersecurity at the moment too. So I think with these juxtapositions, it's this ability to reflect and work through that, have that dialogue, bring, as you mentioned earlier on, this is not just about technology companies, this is about academia, this is about civil society. And one of the things that excited me when you were talking earlier as well, about some of these use cases is and using data we already have but making it more accessible in the right way look at what we've been doing communities you know there's a, there's a project in london at the moment with one of the big museums um, and as part of that we're making existing data available again democratizing access through ai but to schools to people's homes to get involved in kind of you know population management what's happening in your garden what's happening in your street how can you conserve things what you're concerned about and bring all this different data together but keep giving people that control and access to get involved, feel like they have a voice, but learn new skills along the way. That's a lovely example, kind of private-public partnership, actually, too. But uh, yeah, there's just so much in this, isn't there? The juxtaposition, I think, is powerful, and it just brings to the fore, we have to do this in that strategic, thoughtful, reflective way, and bring everybody in on this so that we can identify the things we may not have even thought of yet. Yeah. Well, well, and that's that's the punchline. I mean, honestly, we we you know when when AI was the province of us technologists, we're not we're not super smart when it comes to the real world. In some cases, you know, we we haven't experienced the experience of someone in you know rural England or in Africa in their day to day life. But suddenly, with Gen AI, we have a, a tool that you don't need the technical person in the middle. You can you can start to in, interact with it and be engaged and 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 quite frankly, it can operate on your terms. You know, I was involved a million years ago in a project called One Laptop Per Child, which was uh, we created these these kind of cool laptops that. Uh, uh, but it wasn't about the laptop; it was about the user experience. It was this idea that I could drop a computing device in a in a in a developing country to an illiterate child, a child who couldn't read or write. And because of the iconography of the system, the computer could effectively boot up. They could learn how to use it by using icons, eventually learn how to use language, and eventually learn how to create code. And it was just a fascinating experience of saying, sometimes these technologies, if you make them easy enough to use, the society around it will figure out what to do with it, and they will get better. And we proved that with OLPC because we touched you know, tens and hundreds of millions of children around the world and got them into computer literacy. But at the same time, this is bigger. And you know, then the profound effect, and and you know, and that maybe the message for every enterprise in the world is: you all have customers. You have current customers and future customers. You have stakeholders and constituencies. If you're a, gover- a government, 
think about this tool and ask the question of, are you using it just to serve the people that you currently serve well? Or is this the tool that can actually democratize something, can extend your customer base, can open up a, a larger population that used to have a much higher barrier of entry because now you have a tool that can speak human, a tool that can interact on its own. It doesn't need humans in the middle. It can interact directly with a human being. And that is a profound change, which you know should represent an enormous business opportunity for everybody, a, a way to improve you know, governmental services. You know, when you were saying it, I had this vision. In the United States, we have challenges with what we call the, the DMV, where you get your driver's license. It's it, it, In fairness, there are a lot of very good DMV people, but sometimes it's a rather onerous experience because you're dealing with overworked, stressed out, complex environments where the public servant is really trying their best, but they just got a million angry people uh, talking to them. Well, it turns out that if you took some of this work and instead of having to call the DMV or go to it, you just interacted with a generative AI system and it answered the questions for you and it did the more complex problems, that would probably result in a win-win for everybody. The, the, the stakeholders would probably be happier because they get quicker answers and not have to go to the DMV. The DMV people would be better because they can focus on the high quality work. And, and that's one that, you know, it sounds very simple, but in, at least in the United States, if your DMV experience across the entire country went up by a couple orders of magnitude, the happiness quotient in the country would get better. And so, so you know, those are things that I think are in front of us, but I think they're very realistic and I think they're likely to happen if we get this right. And I think that's a global thing as well, whether it's uh, driving licenses or passports. I think that's a common thing yep. across the world at the moment, isn't it? I, I totally get that. And it also made me smile when you were talking about there. Um, also about just, you know, the power to experiment with this, yep. I think, is such an enriching opportunity. And that's one of the things I've loved about what, what you're doing as well with some of the sandbox solutions you have as well, because it's really this enablement opportunity. You know, whether you're a researcher or a software dev or a data scientist and at different stages as well, it's going to really enable this acceleration of innovation looking at your gen ai workload so i love the fact that we can help people to experiment and cal collaborate better you know i think that's really powerful too but the other thing another little echo that's been coming out of our conversation today is kind of the, the ability to, to scale this and make this accessible to all types of organizations so for all sizes so also thinking about this some of the technology you have like apex is a great example of this as well i think it allows you to do more with what you have and where you are now, without, for example, being kind of daunted by, I've got to have all these upfront costs, I'm not quite sure where we're going. I think it allows you to have that ability to, to experiment more because you can do it on your own terms. You can have those flexible choices around its hardware or life cycle solutions too. And you can predict how you're accelerating that innovation. So I think that's also powerful here to again, get the enablement right to people go on this journey. So again, supporting people in that way, I think it's massively important as well. Oh, no, I 100% agree. And, you know, I mean, look, if at the end of the Gen AI boom, all we have is, you know, five global search engines powered by Gen AI, we did it wrong. And we're convinced now that the real opportunity isn't about that. That's interesting. The real opportunity is about transforming every business, every organization in the world. That immediately says you cannot assume that every organization in the world will have the kind of sophistication and capability set to do this work by themselves. Yeah. And so it is the responsibility of the IT industry, i.e. people like Dell, to step in and make this easy. And so we made a very large announcement with NVIDIA where we, we not only are building new hardware and software and systems, but we're packaging it in a way that imagine you can just buy a system that has foundational models, has the tool chain, has the compute, and you can start your journey almost immediately and jumpstart it to a level that you could almost never have done by yourself assembling these technologies. To Apex perspective, imagine being able to access that kind of infrastructure as a service so that you don't even have to own it. You know, maybe you don't have a data center. Maybe you went 100% public cloud and you don't have any infrastructure. Well, that's okay. Apex is about that. We can put it in a co-location. We can do it for you. There are all kinds of ways that allow you to start the journey, which will likely in your business be more of a private instance because of all the complexity of this. But our job is not to make it more complex, it's to absorb that complexity into Dell. It's to make us the integrator of the technology and make you the consumer and beneficiary of it. And so, so this is one that, honestly, I would tell you a great litmus test of, you know, two things to check when dealing with an AI ecosystem that you're working with. One, are they able to articulate and reflect realistic value propositions that you can go execute on? Do they give you help understanding what problems to solve and how to solve them in a way that actually works? And number two, do they make it easy? 
do they actually, you know, just telling you you can go transform your content repositories is not a sufficient answer. Being able to show you how to do it, being able to take, uh, you know, many, much of the complexity and absorb it into the partner is critical. The only thing I'd leave you with, though, is don't expect it to be free. Don't expect it to be zero work. This is about replumbing your core business processes. This is about your proprietary information. If you think a third party, even Dell, can understand your proprietary information, your proprietary skills and value better than you can, you're fooling yourself. But on the other hand, if as we've learned with things like paired programming, the dojo model and software development, a deep partnership where you have a partner who is helping you de-risk, simplify, accelerate, who's at the table with you and your domain experts who understand your proprietary processes, proprietary information, if they're working together, that's the formula for success in a Gen AI project. And, and you know, so it's not, you know, message, you know, the adult message in the room is you cannot outsource your Gen AI transformation to someone else. You are still the center of that universe. What you can do is assemble an ecosystem around you that operates on the correct terms, understands the reality of enterprise, has experience doing this, absorbs and simplifies the path to you and gives you diversity and choice. If you get those things right and build that ecosystem, you have a very high probability of success. Absolutely. Yeah. I think when we looked at the start of this, we were talking about Gen AI and the future of human machine partnership. But I think it brings in a kind of third pillar here. It's human machine ecosystem yeah. partnership, because that trusted facilitation you were talking about there is absolutely at the crux of this, too. So I think we've almost developed a third pillar to support this. I think I really yeah. do. And it reminds me as well. I know you have a new um, article coming out soon, which drills through some of the things we've talked about and touched on very naturally today around regulating AI um, through shared security secure and sustainable approaches, which I think it's coming out in Politico. So I wanted to mention that too, because I think it's a great example of that power of ecosystem, particularly from private and public um, sector collaboration point of view, which I think is really interesting. And again, so much good from come of, come of that. And I've done a little um, uh, poll to the audience ahead of our, our getting together today. There's a few bonus questions and I have one that I think I can just fit in if we've got time. Oh, no, sure, really, kind of like reflecting on, no, no, no problem at all, um, reflecting on what we're talking about here and kind of people are coming up with how can we learn from what we've experienced before when big changes happen? And admittedly, kind of the scale, the scope, sophistication of what we're talking about here is un is unprecedented in terms of different elements coming together. And I rarely use that word, but I think, I think it's fair in this particular case. But can we reflect on this for other developments to come? So quantum would be one example of that. So what we've seen with, with the acceleration so far, Things we're saying to people, look, think about this now. This is where we might go next. Can we apply this to other areas that are developing too? And I think that's possibly the, the one that springs most to mind as an example, say quantum computing. Yeah, we, you know, we've been working in quantum almost as long as we've been working in advanced AI, uh, you know, going on a decade. Um, I have said very publicly recently that, that we should learn a lesson from the surprise moment of Gen AI. We shouldn't have been surprised, but we were. You know, society, industry was surprised that this was real, that it worked, even though most of us knew it was coming, even though, and I was personally surprised at the quality of these new tools, these new language models. But being having a strategy where you go through life constantly being surprised by disruptions isn't really the best strategy. And so we have to think about the fact that, you know, our disruptions happen when they build on each other. And because they build on each other, they should be more predictable. And so, for instance, the AI boom is the result of us having access to multi-cloud infrastructure, having access to advanced data tools, having access to accelerated compute. All of those things were happening independent of Gen AI. And they created a found, even the internet was a foundation for us to do this. And so if you look at what we have today, and then you look at what's coming and you say, well, well are there any things coming that will actually add to that foundation in a disruptive way. And quantum is a great example of that. Now, quantum machines do not replace all computing, but they allow us to do certain mathematics in ways we've never been able to do at speeds we couldn't even contemplate years ago. And so when you look at things like quantum machine learning, optimization problems, what quantum is good at, it sits right underneath the AI ecosystem. And so we, I can tell you with 100% certainty that the impact of quantum, when it happens, will not be arbitrary. It will be a order, many orders of magnitude acceleration on the efficiency and effectiveness of the AI ecosystems we are building today. Okay, now you're warned. 
So start paying attention to that. Build up your quantum skills. Understand what it means. You don't have to go and buy a quantum computer tomorrow, but you do have to understand what one is. You have to understand how you'd use it. You have to understand what quantum machine learning is, what optimization problems are, how they might be applied so that when, inevitably, and I can't tell you the date, but it's coming, we have viable quantum computing systems of sufficient scale, economically viable, that can be consumed by an enterprise, either as a service or as a product, you are not surprised by it because that will be another moment in time where there will be haves and haves nots. The people who know how to navigate that will get a benefit of a dramatic increase in efficiency, effectiveness, sustainability, all the things that are hard to do today will start to change when quantum becomes more viable. And the people who haven't even thought about it will spend the next two years trying to learn what a quantum computer is. So consider yourself warned. And there will be other disruptions right, like this, but quantum is one that we can clearly see that if you could do it today and slot it into the current generative AI ecosystems, our efficiency of compute, our effectiveness of those systems would be dramatically improved. And so, so yeah, it, it, it's, it's additive. Every time we change something, and it, by many orders of magnitude down the stack, in this case, compute, it has an impact upstream that can be ca- that can be either catastrophic or amazing, <laughs> and and that's what's coming. And like I said, quantum is one that's very obvious. We can see it. I can't tell you the date, but I know it's coming. There will be more. And our strategy as business leaders and technologists should be to understand innovation marches on. There are constantly disruptions, and sometimes if you pay attention to the whole ecosystem, you can kind of see them coming at you. And if you're prepared for them, you get first mover advantage, and you may win in the market. So I couldn't agree more. It's like going back to our previous conversation, we were talking about convergence a lot there as well, and particularly ITOT, for example, and look how that trajectory has progressed, yeah. particularly in the cybersecurity space and across digital and physical lines as well. So it really is. I think you know, I was talking about learning lessons. I think here it's just showing that expression, isn't it? Learning for life, I think yeah. has never mattered more, but also unlearning as well and kind of building that kind of metaphorical toolbox, should we say, of these different types of skills that you can dip into. So with all the change we're talking about here, you have that uh, that kind of canvas to draw in on, whether it's technical skills, whether it's emotional intelligence, whether it's kind of the STEM to STEAM aspect I talk about quite a lot as well. Because again, with that only constant of change, you need to be more confident to be ambidextrous to that, if you see what I mean. I think that's massively important. So it really ties in, not just investment in technology and the future scanning we were talking about just now, but it has to be brought together with the investment in change management, you know, the right right uh, approach CICD, for example, for more agile change, but also skills, skills uplift. And yeah, the hillism we've been talking about today, I think massively, massively comes to the fore here. Yeah. Well, you know, it's a great, great kind of, uh, you know, one maybe final, final point about, you know, when we think about the the kind of content and the capabilities that will be created through Gen AI and through AI systems, they will create new ways for us to interact, to consume new types of products. That's all good. That's all additive. But to your point about unlearning or removing some things, we have to realize that if suddenly there's a better way to do internet search, instead of going to a search engine, you talk to a chatbot. Do you need the search engine anymore? Do you invest in it the same way? If suddenly the best way to answer a customer care question is not to go scrub through 10,000 manuals and use a search engine, but just go to a chatbot and answer the question for you, then maybe we ought to simplify the user experience. There's a concept in the industry called legacy free where you decide that at this point in time, we're not going to do a bunch of legacy. We're going to clip off the past and start fresh. I actually think in the Gen AI boom, we will come to a point where we're, we actually have to do that because we don't have enough capacity to do everything we've ever done and Gen AI. We're going to have to decide that it actually replaces certain things. Certain systems get deprecated. Certain experiences are no longer the best experience and we shouldn't invest in them anymore. And, and that's going to be almost as important as building the new stuff so that you can actually make sure that the new stuff plays a dominant role is is clearly is is the primary interface and when that occurs you know you get rid of all the old stuff and the net effect is you reduce complexity cost uh, by the way, you may notice laptops, something we know very well, don't have RS-232 ports or serial ports on them or parallel ports on them. They're USB, they're HDMI. And that was because we as an industry made a decision to go legacy free, to stop doing all that stuff. And that actually accelerated the compute industry dramatically. It re- drove costs down and it allowed to get a small laptop. I mean, putting a parallel port on a laptop takes a lot of space. 
Uh, you don't need to do that anymore. What's the equivalent of legacy free IT, legacy free business processes when Gen AI hits its stride? What don't you need anymore that can now be replaced? And that that represents cost savings, complexity reduction, all kinds of things that will help us move forward. So moving forward is not all about just adding, it's about subtracting. It's about getting rid of the things that you don't actually need anymore so you can free up precious human and financial capacity to do the new stuff. Oh, absolutely. I love it. I think that's almost a great kind of kind of question to throw out at the end there in terms of everybody who's watching and tuning in today to have a think about that in yeah. terms of that le legacy and uh, and map that because I think that's a great springboard to think about where you want to go next and kind of uh, look at that story differently. Like we said earlier, right at the beginning about changing narratives and working backwards, etc. about what the purposeful application of this technology really is. I think that's a really interesting way to look at it too, John. And I know we're literally out of time, so I am going to have to close this off but thank you so much i love to come back to this again i know we'll have so much more to talk about just in a very short period of time with, with everything that's happening but for now this kind of burning genuine question if, if you will it's been an amazing conversation john so thank you no, so thank much you, for that, I, I guarantee you a year from now we'll be as surprised about the change that we've seen in the last year as we are in the next year so well plenty of opportunities so thanks for having me Oh, my absolute pleasure. Thank you, John. And thank you all for watching and listening to. And also some of the case studies we've mentioned today. We'll put all that together for you as well so you can follow up and dive in deeper and learn more about all things generative AI. We really do encourage you to get involved and be curious. I think that's my other final takeaway as, as a skill here. Always be open to learning and be curious to learn new things. And again, a great way to embrace the possibilities that Gen AI offers. Thank you all. And thank you, John. Thanks for all joining. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Tomorrow's Tech Today. If you enjoy what we're doing, please subscribe to us and leave a review. It really means a lot. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram and see more behind the scenes video footage on YouTube. Thanks for listening.